Uh, hey guys, my name is Alex. I am a lead developer at Tally Ho, um, and I'm here to talk to you about EVM assembly. So the two things we're going to cover in this talk is first, like what is EVM assembly, and second, how to read the opcodes, how to read opcodes and trace an EVM transaction. But I think before we jump into that, it's pretty important to tackle the question of why do we care? Like why would we care about EVM assembly? And I think that there's a few reasons. So. Any of the code that we write as developers is pretty far abstracted from the code that a machine actually interprets and executes. <clears throat> and the closer we get to this real code, uh, and the further we, we get from our abstractions, the more we can reinforce our mental model of, the, of what the machine is actually doing. And I think in general, uh, learning from first principles is a fantastic way to progress as a programmer and to just build solid and bulletproof mental models of what your code is doing. So, what is EVM assembly? Uh, well, let's start with what is the EVM. So you've probably heard of EVM, ZK EVM, EVM OS. There's a lot of terminology, terminology out there right now. But at its core, the EVM is just a stack machine. It's something that uh, takes in instructions, builds up a stack, and then operates on that stack. Uh, most of the operations consume values from the stack. So add takes two values from the stack, adds them, you're left with one value. Multiply takes two values from the stack, adds them, you're left with one value, et cetera. But there are exceptions to this. Um, I think the most notable one is push. So we have push 1 through push 32, which pushes between 1 and 32 bytes onto the stack, uh, respectively. Um, so let's go a little bit more in-depth into the EVM stack machine. So the stack machine has a depth of 1,024 items. Um, each item is a 256-bit word. If you're not sure what a word is, that's OK, and it's not really relevant for this talk. It just it is a slot on the stack machine. Um, during execution, the EVM has uh, memory that does not persist between transactions. It also has storage that does persist between transactions. When we talk about writing to the blockchain, that's what we mean. We are storing things in the EVM. And uh, also compiled smart contract bytecode executes a number of EVM uh, opcodes. So we have some that you might be familiar with if you've looked at x86 assembly, like XOR and add and sub. And we also have a number of uh, blockchain-specific opcodes in the EVM. And we'll dive into more of these a little bit later. And then I think the last important thing about the stack machine is that each operation costs a certain number of gas. So when we pay gas for our transactions, we're essentially paying a little bit or a lot of gas for every single operation that the stack machine executes. All right, so now that we have some understanding of what an EVM is, uh, what is assembly? So assembly? is something that lives in between the code that we as developers write and between the code that uh, a machine interprets. So on one hand, we have solidity, which is nice. Uh, some people think um, easy-ish to read, easy-ish to reason about. And then uh, on, the other end of the, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have bytecode, which is pretty much impossible for humans to read, um, but very easy and very efficient for machines to read. And then in between Solidity and bytecode, we have assembly. So this is kind of what it looks like. And it is an intermediate language or an intermediate representation. Um, and what that means is it is something that lives in between the code that we write and bytecode. And the, uh, <clears throat> the opcodes that you see there are what are actually running in the EVM. So the Solidity or the Viper that we're uh, writing is compiled down to opcodes and then running in the EVM. And that's what that pattern is what lets us have multiple smart contract languages that compile down to EVM and then um, are able to be executed. Or sorry, that compile down to assembly and then are able to be executed. All right, so uh, let's trace a transaction. Um, I have a website up here, www.evm.codes. You might find it useful. You don't need it to follow along. But it's a fantastic reference that has every single opcode in the EVM, how much gas it costs, and what it does. All right, so here I've written this uh, incredibly useful smart contract. Um, we have uh, one storage variable, total supply, and we have a public function that anybody can call that sets uh, total supply to eight. So 
very simple smart contract, not much going on here, not even sure why anybody would use it, right? So uh, the opcodes representing this contract should be pretty simple, right? Um, well, we can take a look. So Sol C provides us with a handy little command where we can pass a contract to Sol C with the opcodes flag, and it will output a opcode representation of that contract. So our simple contract becomes that, which is kind of unreadable. But by the end of this presentation uh, or this talk, you guys will be able to read some parts of it, um, some that are common to all transactions that we see uh, in the all transaction that we see in the EVM and some that are specific to the contract that we wrote. So let's go ahead and trace a specific transaction. Imagine that we've deployed our contract um, at some address, and then we are using ethers to call ultrasoundmoney.setTotalSupply, the transaction that we defined in the beginning. Great. We submitted the transaction. It's been mined. It's part of the blockchain. Uh, let's take a look at it. So. Uh, Geth has this very handy command called uh, debug trace transaction. If you're here for the previous call, you're probably more familiar, uh, familiar with it uh, than most. And what we can do is we can pass in the transaction hash where we, sent, uh, uh, where we invoke that send total supply function and get an opcode trace as well as a, uh, like a historic representation of the stack of that transaction. So basically find out everything that happened in it. Um, so let's trace the opcodes of that transaction. Um, you'll see here that there are some lines um, uh, between these opcodes, and I've divided them into four sections. So that is more so just for clarity, because I want to focus on three parts that are common to every transaction and one part that is common to ours. And I also want to note that uh, what I'm going to show you is not necessarily a one-to-one -one representation of what you'll see when you send debug trace transaction. For example, uh, we're going to be converting hexadecimal numbers to decimals because hexadecimals are hard for humans to read. We're going to be uh, showing Booleans as true or false. But that's just so that what's happening here is uh, so it's easier to follow along with what's happening here. So let's start with the top, this little section. So we have push 10x80. What we're doing here is we're pushing 128 onto the stack. 128, uh, sorry, 0x80 is represented, is the hexadecimal representation of 128. Um, then we're going to push 64 on the stack. And then we're going to call a function called mStore, which is going to store the value 128 at the offset 64 in memory. So what's going on here? We don't have 128. We don't have 64 on the stack, or we don't have 128 or 64 in our contract. So why is this happening? Um, well, what's happening is Solidity uses the memory area between address 0 and address 0x7f, or 127, for internal purposes and stores data starting at address uh, 0x80 or 128. So this is Solidity doing some boilerplate internal memory management for us. Fantastic. We don't have to worry about this as Solidity de developers. This is just a straight win. Wonderful. All right. So now we're going to jump to line uh, 25 in our list of opcodes. Between line 3 and 25, there's some more boilerplate stuff. There's a validation of uh, message.value and uh, making sure like, you can't send ether to a non-payable function. But that is not really relevant to us because our function isn't payable. So we're going to go ahead and skip that. Um, great. So uh, on 25, we're going to push 4 onto the stack. Once again, where is this 4 coming from? And then 26, we're going to encounter our first blockchain-specific uh, opcode. And what we're doing here is we're pushing the size of the input data onto the stack. And as you can see, we pushed 4 onto the stack. Now we have 4 on the stack again. So that means our input data size is 4 bytes. But where did this come from? Um, we didn't send any ether. And we didn't send any uh, arguments along with our function call because there were no parameters. It was just a public function that we invoke. So why is our call data size 4? Well, the answer to this is that when we call uh, get total supply in ethers, under the hood, ethers is going to uh, hash that get total supply function into its function signature and send that along with the input data when we send that transaction. All right, so we know that we have 4. And we know that our call data size is 4. What's going on next? Well, LT, as you may have guessed, checks if, uh, uh, input data, if the input data is less than 4. And what's actually happening is it's uh, looking at the top value of the stack, looking at the second from top value of the stack, and seeing if uh, the second is less than the top value. In our case, it's not, because 4 is not less than 4. So uh, 
we, have, we push false onto the stack. Remember, this would be represented as a 0 or a 1. And then we push uh, 0x280 or 38 onto the stack. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. The next instruction that we see is jump i. And I think of that as jump if. So what that instruction is telling us is if the second from the top value is true, jump to the program counter represented by the top value in the stack. A simple way to think about that is if the second from the top value is true, jump to line 38. Um, since the second from the top value is not true, we don't jump anywhere. And uh, this like, check executes. And essentially what's happening here is that since function signatures are four bytes in length, length, if the call data size is less than four bytes, we know that we can't possibly be calling a valid function. And um, uh, then the function gets reverted if the uh, call data side is, size is less than four. So with that idea of function signatures in mind, let's take a look at uh, the next section. So call data load is another <clears throat> blockchain-specific opcode, similar to call data size, ex except instead of pushing the size of the call data onto the stack, it pushes, pushes the actual call data onto the stack. Remember that the size of our call data was four bytes. So here we have uh, a four-byte hexadecimal value on our stack. That seems relatively arbitrary. But some of you are, are probably correctly guessing that we are actually pushing our function, function signature onto the stack. Uh, on the next line, we have push four, and we push that same exact fun function signature. What's happening here is uh, the contract is checking, OK, I am being sent this function signature. Does it, match, uh, does it match this function signature? And if the answer is yes, uh, represented by the opcode equal, so equal takes two values from the stack and returns, sorry, the top two values from the stack and returns true or false if they're equal, uh, we get a 1 or a 0. And we, in our case, it's true. So once again, uh, we're in that jump i situation. So we have true on the stack. We push 45 onto the stack. And now on line 36, we are, <clears throat> excuse me, on line 36, we're going to jump to line 45 because uh, line 32 was equal to line 33. And hey, uh, we know that this is the function, um, this is the function that we wrote because it's the function that we tried to invoke. Fantastic. And like, this is how the EVM determines which functions to call. If you have many functions in your smart contract, you are going to have many lines of, like, of call data load. Does it equal uh, this function signature? Does it equal this function signature? Does it equal this one? And then if it matches one, it'll jump to that line. And if it doesn't, it'll revert because you cannot call a function uh, that doesn't exist. Awesome. OK, so now we're finally in that very simple function that we wrote. If you recall, it was total supply equals 8. Um, what we see on line 45 is a common command called jump dest, and all that does is it marks that line 45 is a valid destination to jump to. You cannot jump to any arbitrary destination. You need to jump to a valid one or you'll revert. So this just uh, lets us know that, hey, we can jump here. What's the next thing we see? Push 8 onto the stack. All right, awesome. This is definitely code that we wrote. Total supply equals 8. I remember 8. This is us. Cool. But after that, we push 0 onto the stack. So where does the 0 come from? What are we talking about? Well, if you recall, in our very simple contract, we only have one storage variable. And that storage variable, because it's the only one defined, is in the first storage slot. So uh, the first storage slot or the 0 uh, storage slot via array indexing, right? So this is awesome. We have everything that we need. We have 8. We have 0. All we have to do now is save this, and we're done, right? But wait a second. We see that in our transaction, we duplicated. We ran dupe 2, so we duplicated the second from the top word of the stack. OK. Then we swapped the first and second words on the stack. OK. Uh, interesting. And then, all right, great. So now we ran s store. So s store, store and storage. Um, we're saving 8 to the zeroth storage slot. That's what we initially wanted to do. Uh, but then we also have a pop after that, because we have this extra 8 on here. And like, what is this 8 doing? Why, why is it here? Uh, this doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Like, Why are we duplicating and swapping here? Uh, why are we popping at the end? 
uh, the Solidity is doing extra memory management that we don't want, right? Because we want to be as gas efficient as possible and be as um, uh, yeah, be as gas efficient as possible. So we should jump down into Yule and try to optimize this code, right? Uh, well, uh, let's talk about gas optimization uh, using Yule. Um, if you're not familiar, Yule is simply a language that we use to write assembly code in Solidity. It's not exactly like writing opcode. It's not exactly like writing EVM assembly. Um, it has for loops, um, if and switch statements, and it also disallows some commands uh, like jump statements because they quickly become very, very difficult to reason about. Um, and yeah, all right. So we added Yule. We have this optimized set total supply function. It's awesome. Uh, we have an S store with a 0 and an 8, so we're saving 8 to the 0th slot. This is great. This is going to be way better, right? Uh, go ahead and Let's go ahead and measure our, um, our contract. So once again, or let's go ahead and look at the opcode representation of our contract first. So once again, uh, we take a look at the opcodes. And we see that, in fact, uh, optimized set total supply does have less opcodes than set total supply. This is fantastic. We know that opcodes cost gas. We see that uh, set total supply and optimized set total supply have the same opcodes, except set total supply has more. Uh, we just like saved a lot of time and money, right? Uh, but let's like measure it to be extra, extra sure. Um, so here, uh, we, uh, this is, I think, hard hat gas reporter. And we've ran the set total supply uh, function 100 times. And we see that the average gas cost is 22,599. Cool. And then, hey, now we ran optimized set total supply. And we see that the uh, gas cost is 23,591. Awesome, a gas, we have just saved our users like an enormous amount of money, right? Well, uh, not really. I kind of rugged you guys here. Um, so uh, if you notice, optimizer enabled is equal to false. If you're not familiar with optimizer, it's something that uh, you can use in hard hat and in other tools when you're deploying smart contracts. So let's go ahead and enable our optimizer in hard hat. Um, rule set runs to 200, enable it, and remeasure. And in fact, when we have the optimizer enabled, um, it looks like the two functions cost approximately the same amount of gas, right? So all our time uh, spent uh, studying Yule and learning it and learning about SDOR uh, was wasted, right? Well, uh, I wouldn't argue that exactly, but I will say that optimizing smart contracts is hard, and chances are that you're not going to do a better job than the compiler unless you really know what you're doing. Um, contracts containing assembly are generally harder to reason about and harder to audit than contracts written in Solidity and Viper. So what you might gain in gas optimization, you will probably be making a trade-off in uh, contract or user security. Um, and the other thing that's important is if you're writing your own assembly code, always measure and make sure that your implementation is better than the compilers. Because chances are there are some very, very, very smart people working on the compilers and optimizers that know something that you don't when it comes to memory management or safety. Um, and I guess that's essentially my last point. Remember, a lot of the memory management stuff Solidity does under the hood is there for safety reasons. And just because an opcode looks like it's unnecessary doesn't mean that it actually is. That being said, optimizing in Yule and in assembly is definitely something that uh, is needed and useful, especially in DeFi and on mainnet, where uh, gas costs are you know, lower now, but quite higher than a lot of the other chains. Um, but yeah, I guess do so at your own risk. So uh, thank you, guys. Once again, my name's Alex. I'm a lead developer at Tally Ho. And we are hiring Solidity and TypeScript developers. So if this kind of stuff is interesting to you and you're looking for a change, uh, please reach out. And then finally, I want to give a big thanks to Gilbert Garza. He had a lecture at 0x Macro that inspired this talk. And there are uh, a few resource resources on here if you would like to dig deeper on any of the topics. Uh, covered today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, we would have some time for questions, if you like. Uh, why the optimized function spend the same amount of gas if it has more, uh, sorry, less opcodes? So the opcodes that we were looking at were for the, uh, for the unoptimized functions. And we were looking at them because it is like actually it's easier and possible to dissect them in a talk. So when we saw those two uh, opcode, uh, I guess, of like optimized, what was it, set total supply and set total supply, those are the unoptimized opcodes. And then, and then when, uh, 
after the optimizer runs, the opcode representation of those two functions actually becomes the same. Could, uh, what were the, those two opcodes, two extra opcodes doing the swaps were doing on the unoptimized uh, compiled version? The, the optimized compiled version um, was a f a f effectively the same as our opcodes. Um, here, I can show you. So here we have uh, our unoptimized set total supply and our optimized set total supply in our code where the optimizer has not run before. After the optimizer runs, uh, both of these functions um, have, this, have the same exact opcode. And in fact, even though we have two functions in our contract, the optimizer is smart enough to know that they're doing basically the same thing. So the, when we were talking earlier about uh, these selectors over here, Right? Um, so this selector jumps to a destination, and then there would be a different function selector for another function. Um, for, for the other function, they would actually both jump to the same destination, because effectively, what they are doing is the same. Uh, what would be some good use cases for uh, managing uh, the assembly code within contracts? And do you recommend any good resources for learning Yule? Yeah, so I think that the, the best use case that I have seen is a fairly common one where uh, if you're adding two numbers that you are 100% sure will not overflow the, uh, the integer limit, then in assembly, you can, uh, you can add them with a, uh, there's an unchecked flag, which basically tells the, uh, the compiler to not check for uh, integer overflow. I believe that in solidity nine point something, in some fairly recent version of solidity, uh, safe Safe math became, um, I, I guess, like uh, there are a lot of checks that run under the hood. You can turn off those checks if you're sure that you don't need them, but and that'll save gas. But once again, that can be very dangerous. And as far as uh, uh, resources for learning UL, I think just like reading smart contracts and trying to figure out what's going on there is the best way to do it. There are unfortunately no good resources to you to learn UL or really EVM assembly, and which is that I wanted to just talk, just like, uh, yeah. Just to like follow up on that, have you heard of um, Trim? Like the, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So my question is this, right? Like, say for instance, if I'm writing Trim, and I'm basically, you know, trans transpiling my smart contract into into Trim, like, um, what are the, I guess, like the pros and cons to that? as opposed to doing it, um, you know, Yule style, like within Solidity and then using Yule? Unfortunately, I can't, uh, I can't answer that question because I'm not familiar enough with Trim. I do believe that uh, Gilbert was the, the person that I mentioned in my talk, was the person that developed Trim, um, or, or one of the developers, and I would encourage you to reach out to him on Twitter, but I'm not familiar enough with Trim to, to answer that. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I saw somebody asked about Yule. Today there was an awesome workshop about that. It's like two hours long. You should watch that. And then uh, I had a question for optimizer runs. What number do you recommend? What number? Um, I just choose 200 because it's standard. I know, th there's, I know that there is a, or it's not standard, it's just like standard in what I've written. Um, I know that there is a, there's eventually a trade-off size between uh, contract size and, and gas efficiency that you get if you set your optimizer to like, I don't know, 500,000, a million, um, or maybe less. But I generally go with 200. Um, I don't work in the DeFi space, so I'm not like too concerned with ultra, ultra, ultra optimization. But 200 seems to be a, a good number for what I'm seeing. If that was it, thank you so much. Thank you, guys.